We see in various places in the Gospels occasions when the disciples of our Lord did not understand our Lord's teachings or the parables that he was conveying to the people. And our Lord would explain these parables to them. Sometimes they asked our Lord to explain things to him. However, what we see in today's Gospel reading is our Lord doesn't explain anything. And some of his disciples, they say, you know, this teaching is, is difficult. Who can accept it? And some of them actually stop following our Lord. They're, they're kind of walking away. Now, our Lord wouldn't want to lose disciples. God desires the salvation of everyone. God desires everyone to be a follower of his. So if he meant it just as a symbol or as a metaphor or kind of like a parable, you would have called them back and said, wait a minute. I just meant figuratively. I didn't really mean literally that you have to eat my flesh. But he didn't do that. And the reason he didn't do that is because he meant it literally. We must consume his flesh. And notice how he says, you know, it is, it is, it is the spirit that gives flesh, the, or it is the spirit that gives life, the flesh is of no avail. So it's not just his flesh, but what's united to it. The, it's, so it's the body, blood, soul, and divinity. God is pure spirit. So in Holy Communion, we are receiving God into ourselves and this is what makes holy communion so important so this gospel reading it kind of reiterates our lord's teaching of on um, the eucharist and and there are other scriptural passages that do the same so our our belief in in the fact that our lord truly makes himself present under the appearance of bread and wine at every mass and that he gives himself to us in holy communion it reiterates that. But there's another important message here for all of us. And that important message is that we are called to be followers of our Lord. We choose to be followers of our Lord. But we must accept everything that our Lord reveals. In other words, we cannot pick and choose. So there may be things that we aren't totally comfortable with. There may be things that we don't completely understand. But it doesn't matter. We must accept the truth that God has revealed to us. We cannot pick and choose. And there are many Catholics, unfortunately, who tend to do that. They may disagree with some church doctrine, or sometimes especially the moral teachings of the church. You know, a common one that people sometimes disagree with is the use of artificial contraceptives, which is a grave evil. So we cannot pick and choose. When we pick and choose, we are making ourselves the judge of what God has revealed. And if we are making ourselves the judge, then we're placing ourselves above God and kind of having the attitude, I know better than God does. I know better what's good for me. God, God doesn't know. Or the church is mistaken. So when it comes to the church, yeah, there's corruption within the church, you know, especially near the end times, there's going to be efforts to water down the faith and you know, make things look confusing. But the reality is that these, the truths of our faith, and as well as the moral teaching, will continue until the very end of time. And so it's important that we persevere in this attitude of faithful obedience to Holy Mother Church. And when it comes to God, God is, is not some distant being. He's, he's a being who interacts with us. He reveals things to us. He reveals things through the great prophets, through the saints, through the church. You know, there's all kinds of uh, apparitions that have been approved by the church. There's all kinds of miracles that continue to take place even today. And those of you who take your prayer life seriously, you will receive all kinds of inspiration through your life of prayer. So God interacts with us. So we, we need to trust in God. And, you know, if people have issues with certain teachings in the church, you know, especially moral issues, well, it's okay to ask questions but not just to reject the church's official teachings. And when it comes to asking questions, you know, you know, a person who's knowledgeable can easily explain things, but we can also look at empirical evidence. You know, all the moral teachings of the church, we can show empirically that why it's correct. And interestingly enough, there have been some atheists who had concerns about certain moral issues and they came to a conclusion and realized the church had held the same moral position, the correct moral position. And this understanding actually led some atheists to become Catholics. So 
empirical evidence supports the moral teachings of the church. Some people don't realize it, but um, you, you know, in, in today's first reading from the book of Joshua, Joshua says to the people, choose this day whom you will serve. And he talks about the gods of, you know, uh, other peoples, the Amorites and all these things. And it's kind of like, why is he even asking them this question? It's kind of obvious they're not going to serve false gods, that they're going to choose the true God. But when we look at the history of, of the Israelites, they often betrayed their faithfulness to God. So he's asking them this question. And I think it's worthwhile for us to, to kind of consider his challenge, you know, Choose this day whom you will serve. I put that forward to you. Ch you, choose this day whom you will serve. Will you follow the true God? Now, you might respond by saying, Father, that's like a silly question because here we are in church. We've made a sacrifice to be here. We come every Sunday. Obviously, we're choosing the Lord. Well, yes, and that's good. But you see, sometimes it's good for us beneficial for us, extremely beneficial for us, to make a kind of official declarative statement that I choose this day to follow the Lord. And in fact, various popes and, and many saints and mystics have encouraged the faithful to make a consecration of themselves to God, to Jesus Christ, or to Jesus Christ through Our Lady, such as the method put forward by St. Louis Marie de Montfort. Total consecration total commitment to God, a very formal act of commitment to God. And I think it's very important to do that because otherwise we're just kind of going through the motions. And the danger is that we could be, we could kind of go astray, kind of like the Jewish people did. What a lot of people don't realize is that we are actually at war. And I don't mean that we're at war with some other country or some worldly forces. We are in a spiritual war. We are in a spiritual battle and the stakes could not be higher. In other words, our eternal soul is at stake. Our eternal destiny, the reality of heaven and hell, is at stake. So on the one side we have God, we have all the saints, all the good angels. On the other side we have Satan and all the demonic spirits and all those people who rebel against God. Now, when it comes to God, God invites us. God might give us some graces, but he respects our freedom. Satan doesn't invite us. He seduces us. He entices us. He deceives us. He manipulates us. He can actually arouse certain passions and inclinations that we may not even have. Or if we have natural inclinations towards certain sinful things, he can intensify those passions so that we will commit those sins even more often. So Satan and the evil spirits, they want us on their side. They want us to rebel against God. They want us to disobey God's commandments. And they're very good at doing that. And they're very good at using people in the world to promote their agenda. Peer pressure can be very strong. The media can be a great influence upon us. And this is why it is so, so important for us to choose this day whom we will serve. Because when we make that choice, when we make that official commitment to be a follower of our Lord, to serve the Lord, God will not forget that. So even if we happen to stray, let's say, God honors us for our commitment and he'll, he'll try to bring us back. He'll give us even more graces to ensure that we remain on the right path. Now, here's what I suggest to you today. Our gospel reading was reiterating our Lord's true presence in the Eucharist, that he actually gives us his flesh to eat, that we actually receive God and Holy Communion. Here's my proposal to you today. Today, after you receive Holy Communion, you go back to your pew, which is when you're supposed to be doing your devotions. You know, by the way, I, I wanted to mention, sometimes when people come up for Communion, you know, we can bow before Communion or we can kneel. Both are ways of showing that we believe, that we venerate or adore our Eucharistic Lord. But if you're going to kneel, you don't need to bow. And also, I don't need to see you bow. 
And now part of the reason I mentioned this is some people complain that on my side, the communion takes too long. The other thing I wanted to address is sometimes people, after they've received communion, they will make the sign of the cross, or they will bow and, and just pause for a few seconds deep in, in prayer. But I don't need to see that. Why are you manifesting your devotions in front of me? Why are you holding up the communion line? Please don't do that. Go back to your pew, make as many signs of the crosses as you like. Bow your head as much as you want. Give vent to your devotions as much as you like. Yeah, the, the making the sign of the cross, it's, it's something that was never supposed to be done, but it's something that catches on because people see others doing it and they think it looks right. And so people start doing it. But there's all kinds of problems associated with it, with it, which I won't go into. But anyways, today, after you received Holy Communion, after you go back to your pew, here's what I suggest. You commune with our Eucharistic Lord within you. Acknowledge Jesus Christ, the true and living God present within you. Manifest your faith in his true presence within you in the Eucharist. And give gratitude. Thank him for this tremendous gift of himself in Holy Communion, giving you his, giving you his life, eternal life, giving you his graces, his love. And think also of the price that he had to pay to, to make it possible for us to receive him in Holy Communion, being crucified on the cross because of our sins. So acknowledge his true presence, manifest your faith in his true presence, give thanks that he has given you this tremendous gift. And finally, today, manifest your desire to follow our Lord, to serve the Lord, to be faithful to our Lord for the remainder of your life. Consecrate yourself or, or, or surrender your life to him. Say, Lord, help me, help me through this life. Help me to persevere. Help me to make it to heaven. You see, there is no guarantee that we are all going to make it to heaven. We don't know what the future holds. Persecution may come. We don't know what kinds of temptations we, may befall us. We don't know how the evil spirits are going to tempt us. And so it's very important that we invoke God's assistance and that we make this formal dedication to following the Lord. Yes, I know we've done this in many ways previously, but I encourage you to do it today after you receive Holy Communion. Now, if for some reason you can't receive communion, just make a spiritual communion. Converse with our Lord just, just as you would if you had received him in Holy Communion. No problem. So when we do this, we are indicating to God that we want to belong to him, that we want to follow him, and he will honor us for that decision for the remainder of our lives.